The Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus, having prayed, left with his disciples and crossed over the brook Kidron to a place where there was a garden. He and his disciples entered it. Judas, his betrayer, knew the place because Jesus and his disciples went there often. So Judas led the way to the garden, and the Roman soldiers and police sent by the high priests and Pharisees followed. They arrived there with lanterns and torches and swords. Jesus, knowing by now everything that was to come down on him, went out and met them. He said, Who are you after? They answered, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said, That's me. The soldiers recoiled, totally taken aback. Judas, his betrayer, stood out like a sore thumb. Jesus asked again, who are you after? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you, said Jesus, that's me. I'm the one. So if it's me you're after, let these others go. This validated the words in his prayers, I did not lose one of those you gave. Just then, Simon Peter, who was carrying a sword, pulled it from his sheath and struck the chief priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Malchus was the servant's name. Jesus ordered Peter, put back your sword. Do you think for a minute I'm not going to drink this cup the father gave me? Then the Roman soldiers under their commander, joined by the Jewish police, seized Jesus and tied him up. They took him first to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the chief priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it was to the advantage, their advantage, that one man die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. That other disciple was known to the chief priest, and so he went in with, the, with Jesus to the chief priest's courtyard. Peter had to stay outside. Then the other disciple went out, spoke to the doorkeeper, and got Peter in. The young woman who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, aren't you one of this man's disciples? He said, no, I'm not. The servants and the police had made a fire because the cold of the cold and were huddled there warming themselves. Peter stood with them trying to get warm. Annas interrogated Jesus regarding his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I've spoken openly in public. I've taught regularly in meeting places and the temple where all the Jewish leaders come together. Everything has been put out in the open. I've said nothing in secret. So why are you treating me like a conspirator? Question those who have been listening to me. They know well what I have said. My teachings have been above board. When he said this, one of the policemen standing there slapped Jesus across the face saying, how dare you speak to the chief priest like that? Jesus said, if I've said something wrong, prove it. But if I've spoken the plain truth, why this slapping around? Then Anna sent him, still tied up, to the chief, to chief priest Caiaphas. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was back at the fire, still trying to get warm. The others there said to him, aren't you one of his disciples? He denied it, not me. One of the chief priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off said, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. Just then, a rooster crowed. They led Jesus then from Caiaphas to the Roman governor's palace. It was early morning. They themselves didn't enter the palace because they didn't want to be disqualified from eating the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and spoke, what charges do you bring against this man? They said, if he hadn't been doing something evil, do you think we'd be here bothering you? Pilate said, you take him, judge him by your law. The relig religious leaders said, we're not allowed to kill anyone. This would confirm Jesus's word, indicating the way he would die. Pilate went back into the palace and called for Jesus. He said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you this about me? Pilate said, do I look like a Jew? Your people and your high priest turned you over to me. What did you do? My kingdom, said Jesus, doesn't consist of what you see around you. 
If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I'm not that kind of king, not the world's kind of king. Then Pilate said, so are you a king or not? Jesus answered, you tell me. Because I am king, I was born and entered the world so that I could witness to the truth. Everyone who cares for truth, who has any feeling for the truth, recognizes my voice. Pilate said, what is truth? Then he went back to the religious leaders and told them, I find nothing wrong in this man. It's your custom that I pardon one prisoner at Passover. Do you want me to pardon the king of the Jews? They shouted back, not this one, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a Jewish freedom fighter. So Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers, having braided a crown from thorns, set it on his head, threw a purple robe over him, and approached him with, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they greeted him with slaps in the face. Pilate went back out again and said to them, I present him to you, but I want you to know that I do not find him guilty of any crime. Just then, Jesus came out wearing the thorn crown and purple robe. Pilate announced, Here he is, the man. When the high priests and police saw him, they shouted in a frenzy, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told him, You take him! You crucify him! I find nothing wrong with him! Jesus answered, We have a law, and by that law... Oh, the religious leaders answered, We have a law, and by that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he became even more scared. He went back into the palace and said to Jesus, where did you come from? Jesus gave no answer. Pilate said, you won't talk? Don't you know that I have the authority to pardon you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus said, you haven't a shred of authority over me except what has been given to you from heaven. That's why the one who betrayed me to you has committed a far greater fault. At this, Pilate tried his best to pardon him, but the religious leaders shouted him down. If you pardon this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone setting himself up as a king defies Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he led Jesus outside. He sat down at the judgment seat in the area designated Stone Court. It was the preparation day for Passover. The hour was noon. Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king, they shouted back. Kill him, kill him, crucify him. Pilate said, am I to crucify your king? The high priest answered, we have no king except Caesar. Pilate caved to their demand. He turned him over to be crucified. They took Jesus away. Carrying his cross, Jesus went out to the place called Skull Hill, where they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote a sign and had it placed on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was right next to the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The Jewish high priests objected. Don't write, they said to Pilate, the king of the Jews. Make it, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate said, what I have written, I've written. When they crucified him, the Roman soldiers took his clothes and divided them up four ways. To each soldier, a fourth but his robe was seamless, a single piece of weaving. So they said to each other, let's not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. This confirmed the scripture that said, they divided my clothes among them and threw dice for my coat. While the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus's mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her. 
he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. To the disciple, here is your mother. From that moment, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Jesus, seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record might also be complete, then said, I'm thirsty. A jug of sour wine was standing by. Someone put a sponge soaked with wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. After he took the wine, Jesus said, it is done, complete. Bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. Then the Jewish leaders, since it was the day of Sabbath preparation, and so the bodies wouldn't stay on the crosses over the Sabbath, it was a high holy day that year, petitioned Pilate that their legs be broken to speed death and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man crucified with Jesus, and then the other. When they got to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers stabbed him in the side with a spear. Blood and water gushed out. The eyewitnesses to these things has presented an accurate report. He saw it himself and is telling the truth so that you also will believe. These things that happened confirm the scripture. Not a bone in his body was broken. And the other scripture that reads, they will stare at the one they had pierced. After all of this, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he was intimidated by the religious leaders, petitioned Pilate to take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so Joseph came and took the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus at night, came now in broad daylight, carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. They took Jesus's body, following the Jewish burial custom, wrapped it in linen with the spices. There was a garden near the place he was crucified, and in the garden, a tomb in which no one had yet been placed. So because it was the Sabbath Sabbath preparation for the Jews and the tomb was convenient, they placed Jesus in it. Today is Good Friday. Today is the day that we come together electronically today, but we come together to hear about the day where everything changed. Good Friday, Jesus's death, the event that rocked the world. This day that is usually hard because when we take the time and when we really stop and engage with the readings and the reality, can be overwhelming and emotionally difficult. This year, in the middle of a pandemic, everything is overwhelming and emotionally difficult. This year, I was profoundly struck by the parallels of Good Friday and the COVID-19 pandemic. I was thinking about the emotions of surprise and fear the really stressful experience of the time, disappointment, being completely overwhelmed, having a sense of something unexpected. And even though there was a warning, people didn't understand. Lots of questions of what comes next, all at the same time being a little lost, a little lonely, and perhaps even feelings of betrayal. As I made this list of emotions and plot points, I realized it could be for either experience, the feelings and the experiences of the disciples on the day that Jesus died, or for those of us who are living in this pandemic today. So today, we sit in this time this really hard time 
in our separate places. Usually when we are together, usually when we can be in the same building to walk the hard journey of Good Friday in the same place. This year in our separate places, I'm wondering how we might really sit with the reality the loss and the pain of Jesus's death and how that might become overwhelming when you pile on the pain of the pandemic. I wonder how we can be in that place and recognize what is happening around us without becoming paralyzed by fear and anxiety and pain. There are two things that we particularly need in times of grief and trauma. One is relationships and the other is routine. In our time today, both of these have been disrupted by our pandemic. Our relationships are not the same. Our routines are definitely not the same. But this might be where we can look to the gospel, where we can see how the disciples in a day were suddenly had relationships redefined. There's that beautiful moment when Jesus looks down from the cross and sees his mother and his beloved disciple and says, mother, here is your son, son, here is your mother. He completely changes a relationship. And that beloved disciple takes Mary into his home as his mother, into his community. Um, the, the original language is very clear that it was a shift of the relationship and a new bonding happened there. I'm also struck when we look at the big picture of the gospel and what happens is that there is a routine that is kept. It is very tenuous, their life has been flipped upside down, yet the followers of Jesus still observe Sabbath. It is only after the Sabbath day that they will come back and return to that tomb where Jesus is. I was thinking about those pieces and how they might inspire us. Because our community is completely disrupted. We don't see each other in person at this time. But we have so many opportunities to continue to build community. Obviously, we gather for worship on Zoom or Facebook Live. Lots of people have been making phone calls or sending cards or sending emails. To whom might you speak? To whom within our community or in the wider community? How might your relationship with that person be transformed because of the opportunity to connect in a new or a different way? Perhaps in this time, we can become blessed by new or renewed relationships. Routines. I don't know about you, but my routine is all out of whack. Before, if you'd asked me, so how are you? My standard answer has always been crazy because I was running here and running there and doing this and doing that and had a million things to do and 47,000 emails to reply to and just things to do, places to go, people to see. During that time before, I had a lot of friends who, who were also running on too few cylinders for way too long. Now your routine might have looked different than mine, but I'm sure that now is not the same as it was. So in this time, how might we create a new schedule? How do we want to use the time that we were, are in right now during this pandemic? And then when we think about after, how do we want to create a new schedule? Now, as I've said in other places, this is a pandemic. It's a trauma. There is lots of stuff going on. We are overwhelmed by that emotion. So part of this time is just being kind to ourselves. It's okay that we don't do, do, do. It's okay to sit and grieve. 
It's okay that if you had a traumatic experience now, that traumatic experience comes back to us when we have new trauma. However, there are routines that we might choose. It might be that we choose to come together for worship on a regular basis. We've been here for Holy Week, and maybe we'll keep coming back for Sundays. It may be that you choose to add a midday prayer that happens on Facebook Live, or you find some other worship service happening. Everybody's doing this whole Facebook Live, Zoom worship experience. You can see them on YouTube. It might be that you choose to take time to just sit and pray. however you choose to use this time, the one thing that I continue to encourage people to do is to breathe. Breathe to not get overwhelmed by the anxiety. Refocus that anxiety into something else. Try to create some moments of peace. Good Friday. This is a day of grief. And this is a time of trauma. So let us be gentle with ourselves and each other. And while we sit in the dark and wait, we wait for both Jesus's resurrection. Boy, it's a really good thing that we know that it's about to come. And as we sit in the dark and wait for the end of this pandemic, about which we don't know the timing, but about which we will know that it will end. Let us recognize that there is grief now and there is grief to come. There is anxiety now, but let us work on releasing that. Let us be comforted by the knowledge that God is love, that we know that resurrection will come. We know that Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit is with us. And let us be assured that grace will come out of any grief or trauma that we experience and that we can be part of helping others find and name their grace. And in this time, let our community be strengthened, our relationships with one another and all the world be strengthened in God's love. Amen.